Uh, Steve, I think you might just be on mute. If... Try a second start. Thank you very much, Teru. Uh, always need to start like that on an online event. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very delighted to be facilitating this session today. And I would also like to uh, thank AMO for taking the leadership in terms of bringing this very important conference to the region to have such a good debate on, uh, the, on energy systems integration. So as to reset, my name is Steve Heinen and I'm the energy systems analytics manager at Vector Limited. Um, Vector is the largest gas and electricity distributed in New Zealand and one of the largest smart meter providers in Australia and New Zealand. Just want to go through a few housekeeping uh, topics just before we, we start. So I want you to all notice that this session will be recorded. Um, all participants are muted and we will do a, a question and answer session through Slido, uh, which you can access through slido.com and you can um, put in the code for this session, which is ESIC minus hyphen 3B. Um, to connect to an um, online dashboard where you can ask uh, your questions um, to the different presenters today. That being said, um, I just want to briefly introduce our session today. Um, so in Australia particularly, you see that new distributed energy technologies, especially renewables, especially as well as digitalization and customer behavior are blurring the traditional energy chain boundaries. And this is happening at an exponential uh, pace. So while this transformation creates unprecedented complexities and new opportunities, the results will also reveal new value stream and new physical realities um, at the traditional boundaries between customers and the network and obviously between transmission and distribution, the focus of today's session. So we will hear today from three excellent speakers um, on first-hand experiences and state-of-the-art implementations about the, how these traditional boundaries between transmission, distribution, but also smart meters, DERs, and customers are being bridged and transformed into a new energy uh, value chain. Without further ado, I will start with the kickoff with uh, Jackie Bridge, uh, who is from Aus Ausnet Services, um, which she's giving her presentation for. She's, she's now done a new role as the general manager for asset strategy and planning with uh, PowerLink in uh, Queensland. Uh, but her today's presentation is really much focused on her experience with, um, uh, um, with Ausnet. Uh, Jackie has more than 20 years of experience in energy sector, so um, she brings a lot of experience about having witnessed already the many transformations that we've seen in these industries. So I think we're very uh, delighted to hear um, how you look at the challenges coming ahead and um, and where uh, where you see us going from here. The floor is yours, Jackie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. And good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, so I'm really happy to begin this um, presentation on transformation of the energy value chain. As, as Steve mentioned, I've recently changed jobs, so I'm presenting this on behalf of Osnet. Uh, so the next slide, please. Osnet owns um, multiple utilities in Victoria, including electricity transmission, electricity distribution and gas. And I thought I'd just start off, I'm sure we're all well aware of the evolution of the energy ecosystem and how quickly things are changing at the moment. But I thought I'd start off with, I think this is a really effective illustration of how businesses in the energy system are transforming the way they think about themselves. So this is an illustration from Osnet's 2015 business review where we depicted our networks and our business as very much a linear, um, uh, supply chain with a large generator at one end, a customer at the other end, and our electricity networks in the middle. And if we leap forward only five years um, to the next um, diagram, this is from the 2020 annual report, which shows much more of a system uh, kind of view of, of the of the networks that are that Osnet is owning. And the obvious additions are the um, the inclusion of large scale renewable technologies um, connected into the transmission network. Then there's obviously a lot more detail about the distributed energy resources at the customer end. And also I think showing the, the much uh, clearer view that it's a system is the uh, in inclusion of the gas network, um, showing that the system is actually um, 
considering other fuel types, not just electricity. So I think that's quite a big change in how we see the business in only a five year period and how we show it in public reports. So if we move forward to the next slide, thinking about the energy value chain. Now this is not the be all, not the definitive, um, uh, I suppose, uh, illustration of how value is changing, but I think it's undeniable that there are many more opportunities for value um, at the behind the meter end of the chain and that though, though all those new technologies that have become available and are um, emerging are uh, bringing a shift in value um, to the uh, customer end of the chain. And um, that will be the topic of the following two presentations from Rick and from Bryn. So I'm going to focus on the impact on networks. Now, um, I think for me, the, the summary of this slide is not that these are the absolute increases, decreases or, or, or no change. I think it's really about, my, in my personal view, I think large scale and small scale uh, generation is going to be essential to the energy system in future. And for me, that means that it's very clear that transmission and distribution networks will play a very important role. I think that role is, is transforming as well with the system changes. But the, the transmission and distribution networks will be essential for allowing the power to not only move from one location to another, but also providing um, a platform for services to be provided and for value to be extracted from the system by various different participants. So if we can move forward. Now I had originally um, intended to go into quite a lot of detail in terms of um, what some of the challenges and opportunities are that are parallel between the transmission and the distribution networks. But, and I will spend some time on this, but I've also added in some slides into this deck um, looking at some of the impacts of um, COVID on consumption in Victoria in particular. So I will spend some time on this slide, which is highlighting a number of issues, which again, I'm sure that listeners are very familiar with and have heard mentioned many times in the media. So some of the challenges of this transformation for networks are system strength, thermal limitations, voltage management and contingency management. Um, so I think um, for me, I think the issues of thermal limitations and voltage management are um, being felt in a very similar and parallel way by both transmission and distribution networks. So the um, thermal limitations comes into the fore when um, we're seeing generation connecting in parts of the network where it had never previously been anticipated. So the, the sheer um, volume of those new generation connections exceed, is, is likely to or is already exceeding the um, actual capacity of the network in those new areas. And with that comes also challenges with voltage management where our um, the networks, the traditional design of the network expected voltage to fall as the power flowed from the large generator towards the customer. Now, when we see that um, generation is being injected throughout the network in very different locations, what we're actually finding is we're, we're trying to manage high voltage issues rather than low voltage issues. So it's really a paradigm shift in both the distribution and the transmission networks to try and deal with both the thermal limitations and the voltage um, control in, in both networks. And there's very much an interaction as well between the two networks. And I, I think what I would say about the system strength and the contingency management categories here is that the interplay between the two um, networks is going to be more and more critical to better understand where system strength, at the moment we see a system strength gap declared in Victoria and now also in Queensland. So I'm, I'm following the system strength um, gap De declarations in my in my career, it seems. Um, but um, contingency management and system strength are both impacted not only by what happens in the transmission network, but increasingly by what is occurring in the distribution network. So I think the um, the key points for this slide are that there are challenges to be um, to be managed in both networks, and we need to work together across both transmission and distribution to ensure that we've got a system 
that works well, that interacts and that we understand what's happening. Uh, okay, and if we can go on to the next slide, one of the one of the big changes that's occurring, which is creating a lot of challenges, is the um, reduction in minimum demand. Now, this chart was extracted from the most recent um, electricity statement of opportunities that was published in August. And it shows a decline in minimum demand being forecast for all regions. But if you look at the orange line, which is the forecast for Victoria, you can see it's an extremely dramatic um, reduction in minimum demand over the next 10 years to the point where within 10 years, um, this forecast shows a negative minimum demand. Now, there's a lot of um, um, details behind these forecasts and what they're actually intended for, but I think the general sense that minimum demand is it going to occur or is already occurring in the daytime rather than the nighttime, and that it is dropping across all of the regions in the NEM is a, is a significant challenge, which will, um, which will uh, link back to voltage management system strength and so on and operational challenges for the networks going forward. So I think again, the interaction between distribution and transmission is critical to understand. Okay, uh, if we, um, uh, and this is really just a snippet from, uh, from a LinkedIn article um, from uh, Paul McArdle where he was exclaiming about the minimum demands and the actual minimum demands being recorded during August and September in Victoria. So in August, uh, there was uh, a minimum demand which was similar to previous minimum demand from two, the year 2000 and the year 2017. And then within a week of that um, August uh, actual recording, we recorded a significantly lower number of 2,690 megawatts, which was about 250 meg lower than the previous recording. So. If you're wondering whether those forecasts from AEMO are um, on track, the, the actuals for this year at least uh, are indicating that they are. So if we can move forward to the next slide. Okay, so I thought I'd just take the last couple of minutes to show some of the analysis that's been occurring in Victoria um, since the start of the COVID um, restrictions. Now, if you could go to the next slide, uh, Victoria has been um, subject to the most severe and prolonged restrictions due to the number of cases in COVID, of COVID in Victoria. And so um, right at the start around April, we began to look at what the changes um, were in different customer categories and different regions. So there are five distribution networks in Victoria. And this chart shows the increase and decreases in different customer categories. So the blue is residential, the yellow is um, small to medium enterprises, and the green is large enterprises. And then the, the sort of dark blue is the overall for each network. So I guess what we're seeing here is from um, April to August, we, we saw unsurprisingly quite a big increase in consumption for residential customers. and also a decrease in the small, medium and large um, business categories. Overall, the consumption for Victoria was down only 2% compared to the same period for the, the previous year, um, but very much a change in consumption in the different customer categories. Now I've got two more slides, which I'll um, go to the next one. This is um, this slide shows the distribution and the changes for in this in this particular slide, this is looking at residential consumption in April 2020 compared to the 2019 consumption, and the the, the cool colours show an increase anywhere between a 10% to a more than 30% increase. The dark, the the red and orange colours are indicating a decrease. So, um, not surprisingly, across all these different regions, we saw an increase in residential residential consumption in April during the first um, lockdown period or the first restrictions period. Now, what I've done on the final slide is to show um, the, the different customer categories and this analysis repeated for each customer category for each month. So you can see that um, there were periods where um, 
there was significant increase in consumption for residential customers, in some cases more than 30% increase in some regions. And, and then um, again, unsurprisingly, um, very much the red and orange colours for showing significant decreases in the business categories. Um, then I think the other thing for me that was interesting was as the different lockdown stages changed. So in June, we had quite a big release of um, restrictions and businesses were allowed to open. Many businesses were allowed to open. So you can see that June looks quite different to the other months. And then unfortunately in July and August, we've gone again back into lockdown. So um, I think for uh, future electricity um, network operation, what we're really interested in is how those restrictions might change and how customers' behaviour will change and whether people will go back to work or may continue to work from home throughout the summertime and what sort of challenges that might bring for load on the network and consumption. So I think I'll leave it there um, and um, hand back over to Steve or to Rick. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you, that's a brilliant presentation. and. Um, I like to think that to no surprise, none of the cost benefit studies in Victoria did consider the value of uh, smart meters during a global pandemic. So, uh, no, I, I don't think that was on the list of <laughs> So, <laughs> that was very good. Um, no, thank you for that. Also, great to have the you know perspective of obviously a joint asset owner with transmission and distribution. So, I think that you know your new position like that to be sharing your experience on that. Uh, We'll now move over um, to the United States, where we, uh, where Rick um, uh, Rick O'Connell is joining us. Um, he's the executive director at GridLab. Um, GridLab is um, a think tank or consultancy, I guess, which provides tank technical grid expertise to enhance policy decisions, um, and really, you know, provide the technical expertise to enable the rapid transition to a reliable, cost-effective, and low-carbon future. Um, before starting at Grid Lab, um, Rick Connell was um, uh, was with Black and Veatch for Black and Weech for more than 12 years, where uh, he was instrumental in building the global renewable energy consulting practice. So, Rick, it's very important for us to hear what's going on in the United States. So, over to you, and um, thank you again for uh, for being open to share your experience with us. Great, thank you so much, Steve, for that introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I, it seems like I've been, um, you know, the yank sandwich, the two between two Australians, uh, secretly, I'm actually Australian. I was born and raised in Melbourne. Um, but it's been obviously, as you can tell from my accent, a long time since I was a young boy when I left, uh, Australia. So exciting to be here and share some high level experiences, sort of takeaways for what's going on in the United States. Um, focused on DER. Uh, obviously, that's a big topic in the US as a big country, so I'll stay high level, but I'm happy to, uh, if you want to use Slido, um, you know, and ask, and ask, ask more deeper questions. So, Tara, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, a couple of things. We just had actually a big federal order on distributed energy resources, uh, 2222. I'll talk about that. I'll talk a little bit about the new IEEE 1547. 2018 smart inverter um, equipment standard, and then a little bit about integrated distribution planning. Uh, so next slide, please. So just for those of you maybe not familiar with the US, just a quick primer. Um, when people ask what kind of regulation we have in the United States, the answer is yes. Yes, we have that kind. Um, so we have a mix of state and federal regulation. And depending on where you are in the US, you either are in a fully restructured market, uh, so full retail competition, full wholesale competition with a wholesale market operator similar to AMO in, in, in the NEM, um, or you're in a partially restructured market where you still have a vertical utility uh, that's both a load serving entity and owns, owns wires, uh, you know, sort of vertically state regulated in, entity on the retail side, but then there's wholesale competition. So that's kind of in the middle of the country uh, in the US. Um, or also in California, or you're in a uh, just vertical, pure vertical market where there's like almost zero, very little competition. Uh, and there's, you know, your vertical utility that does both, you know, generation, transmission, and distribution and serves load. Uh, so we've got all, all the kinds of, all, all, all the kinds of regulation. So it makes it a little more challenging um, when you're talking about policy in the United States because 
it's, it depends on where you are. So next slide, please. So where are we with the U.S. and and again, it's hard to generalize, but DER really the the, the fed, our federal regulator uh, just issued Order twenty two twenty two. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when I talk about wholesale markets. It's been a big. We've been waiting four years for this. It just literally came out two weeks ago, so it's kind of hot off the presses. Um, I think it's going to have some pretty significant impacts in terms of states. California and Hawaii are really kind of the South Australia of uh, I would say, or maybe of of uh, the US, they've got the highest DER penetrations. Uh, there were early adopters of smart inverter standards. In fact, you know, the California Smart Inverter Working Group actually really was the precursor to the new IEEE 1547 version. Um, but for the rest of the states, IEEE 1547 uh, equipment will be available probably early next year. And we'll see, you know, there's states around the US that are kind of gearing up to roll out new smart inverters. Um, and some states are moving forward on what we call integrated distribution planning, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So if we couldn't go to the next slide. So I think the the big issue that we've been wrestling with in the US for for a while is, you know, can DER provide value to wholesale markets? And so, you know, right now, the way DER is mainly compensated in the United States is through net metering, so really an avoided retail tariff. Um, and that's either, you know, for residential customers, really avoided energy, um, you know, for some commercial customers who would deploy batteries, they're getting avoided, you know, kind of capacity or demand charges. But it's really most of the value for DER has been on the retail side. Um, and there's been some work, you know, there's been a couple of, of pilot, you know, virtual, virtual power plants, um, you know, some distribution connected resources participating in wholesale markets, but for the most part, DERs have really participated in retail, retail markets. Um, so this new federal rule that just came out is, is basically an instruction to all the wholesale market operators, you know, folks similar to AMO, that they have to go and develop a tariff. Um, they have to go and develop a tariff and they're, you know, so the federal rule doesn't have any sort of detail around telemetry or you know, bidding or what kinds of market products, but it just says that, you know, aggregations of distributed energy resources should be allowed to participate in wholesale markets. And it doesn't, you know, so it's up to the wholesale market operators to kind of come up with solutions to ESO, DSO interface and some of the thorny issues around how that actually works and what that looks like. But I think that's actually going to unlock a lot of um, interesting innovation in the U.S., around DERs providing value to wholesale markets. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to watch. So this is really the, you know, the federal order really is going to now kick off over the next two years. You're going to see the wholesale market operators basically creating, creating market products for DERs and allowing DERs to participate. And then you're going to see DER providers really, you know, plugging in and, and creating those. So let's go to the next slide. So You'll see here that I'm sort of moving back and forth between kind of wholesale market participation and then kind of down more into detail kind of volts and amp stuff. So, you know, please forgive me. This is eSig. We're allowed to talk about lots of things, right? Um, so the other thing that's really important is for, D, for DER, at least when DER first started happening in the, in the U.S., that whenever there were any kind of grid disturbances, you know, DERs were really expected to trip offline immediately. So if there's any kind of frequency or voltage excursion, DERs would just trip off. But now that we have, you know, gigawatts of DER on these interconnections, you, the last thing you want is you have some kind of network disturbance, like a frequency excursion, uh, and you've got, now you have gigawatts of generation tripping offline. Um, so, as I mentioned, the Smart Inverter Working Group in, in um, California started developing these standards, and, and IEEE 1547 2018 came out in 2018. The .1 standard came out just recently. Uh, for the testing and certification. And so we're going to see equipment that's 1547, 2018 compatible, really available early next year. And so what 1547 does is it allows for frequency ride through, uh, voltage ride through, frequency response. So it's really a lot of bulk system friendly, really making DERs much more grid friendly and be able to provide you know, system support. So some of those things that Jackie was talking about around um, you know, contingency management, I think, is going to be much easier. It also includes for it, it also includes communications capability. Uh, so, you know, DERs has the capability to communicate. And just to be clear, you know, 
the US doesn't have a grid code concept or paradigm, right? So 1547 is an equipment standard, and it's still up to individual states and it actually individual utilities to create interconnection requirements. So we're seeing that happening across the US now where individual utilities are creating interconnection requirements for DERs and sort of setting these standards. And there's been a lot of collaboration between folks like IEEE, NERC, which is the North American Reliability Corporation. It's it's our nonprofit corporation that's tasked with maintaining reliability on the bulk system. Um, and so one of the things that NERC's recently done is stand up this cute named spider web or spider working group, which is the system impacts from DER, really thinking about what are the bulk system impacts from large DER deployment and you know, do the reliability standards that we have for the bulk system need to be updated to take into account DERs. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on there uh, and I'm happy to talk more in detail about that. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, something I'm gonna talk about really quickly is I mentioned that in the US retail is um, the, the majority of the value that uh, DERs provide is really to retail customers through retail rate structures, through net metering. Starting, we've, we've started a couple of years ago um, you know, especially in New York uh, with the REV process. Uh, but then I think, you know, Australia stole Audrey Ziebelman from us. So now, you know, that, that process has slowed a little bit since he's now taken over at head of AEMO, but really moving towards a more locational value for DER and a different kind of tariff structure as opposed to net metering, which is a bit of a blunt instrument and like really thinking about what's the locational value, both on avoided transmission, avoided distribution, environmental value, uh, energy value, capacity value of, of DER. And, and so many states are sort of deep into thinking about that, California, Illinois, New York, um, so Massachusetts. Uh, but I don't think there's strong consensus yet over what that's going to look like. And I think that's going to be a couple more years of thinking around what the ideal, you know, sort of tariff structure for DER is going to look like. We can go to the next slide. And then the other thing I think that's that's interesting is really thinking about, you know, so we're, we've talked about, so I talked about, you know, what's the value of D, D, DR combined to wholesale, um, rethinking the sort of retail value for DER, rethinking the sort of bulk system impacts for DER. And I think the last piece is really, what's the impact of DER to distribution grids? Um, so as all of you know, you know, distribution grids were really kind of planned. Um, you know, really for one-way power flow, they were really weren't planned to be this kind of dynamic platform for DER to really plug into. And I think that um, that's slowly changing and many states are implementing what we call integrated distribution planning. And so thinking about when they're just, when they're planning their distribution system, not just simply like, well, do I need a bigger transformer here or larger wires, reconductor this, thinking about how DER could potentially, so not only planning their system for, more DER, such as electric vehicles, electric, more electric building load, um, but also could DER provide some of the services that traditional poles and wires um, pro provide? So something we call non-wire solutions. Uh, and again, I would say we're still in the early days of this. We're still thinking through what the best practices are, how it's going to work, what it's going to look like. We've got some good pilot non-wire solutions, um, but it's really you know, a handful of projects around the country, not a, there's not a strong uh, track record in history for, for, for this, but I think we're getting better. And then I think there's like a very early conversation happening about, well, does it make more sense to move to kind of a more UK open network DSO model where you have a separate distribution systems operator that's separate from the owner of the assets? Because right now, all of our distribution companies are both owner of the asset as well as operator of the distribution system. Um, unlike on the wholesale side where we've, you know, at least in, in competitive markets where we've broken apart the, uh, the asset owners and the, and the operator of the system. So that's still very early in the US. Um, but that's my sort of, you know, 15 minute race through what's going on in, in the US. I think there's, you know, a lot happening. It's probably moving a little slower than uh, than Australia, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a big oil tanker. Um, well, hopefully it's not full of oil anymore, but, you know, it takes a while to turn. So things, things happen. Uh, and happy to, to 
when, and really looking forward to uh, hearing from Bryn, who I think, you know, I think you're really going to love the next presentation because I, I knew I was very excited about it. There's some really innovative stuff happening in Australia. And I think, you know, Australia can potentially learn from the U.S., but I think the U.S. can absolutely learn from the really great stuff that's happening in Oz. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rick, for this presentation. You know, the world is really flat when it comes to the, the transformation of the energy system. So um, thank you for sharing, you know, your insights of us. It's really important for us down under to understand what's going on. And, you know, I think this, you know, it's not everybody moves at his pace, but I think everybody is good at different things and individual points. So we really need to learn from each other and understand from each other. You know, so uh, appreciate you joining us today to share that, uh, that view about what's going on in the U.S. So uh, we'll move now to the next uh, and final presentation of this panel, which is from uh, Bryn Williams from SA Power Networks, the sole um, distributor in uh, South Australia, um, a region which is probably experiencing one of the highest penetrations of um, you know, residential scale solar. Um, and um, Bryn is in a unique position there where he's um, leading the future network strategy, which is the strategic blueprint for transforming South Australia's networks and the services to meet customers' future demand. So um, um, Bryn is going to share some really interesting um, insights um, about the evol evolving distribution network and how they are enabling new value. Um, um, Bryn's previous roles prior to SA um, Networks um, involved um, a range of consultancy jobs um, um, as a consultant for a range of corporate and government clients in Australia, advising um, technology strategy and telecom. So um, he brings a lot of experience uh, in this space with him, and we're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Bryn, for joining us this morning. Uh, thanks, Steve. So if you can just go to the first slide, thank you. Um, so in Australia, I think more so than anywhere else in the world, the transition to renewable energy is being characterized by a, transmit, a transition from central generation to small scale distributed energy. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here in South Australia, we're at the forefront of this transition uh, nationally. We have more than one in three of our customers now have got uh, rooftop TV on their roofs. Um, that's a total installed capacity of about 1.5 gigawatts. Um, to put that in perspective, that's now roughly equivalent to the typical demand for the whole state of South Australia. Um, we're also seeing significant uptake of residential batteries in South Australia. Um, we've got about 15,000 customers with residential batteries now in our network, and about 5,000 of those are aggregated into virtual power plants. Where we've got uh, nine different virtual power plants operating in South Australia today. Uh, next slide, please. So, as a distribution network, what does that mean for us? It means that the role of the distribution network is changing. So, for um, more than 100 years, our network did precisely one thing, which was the thing it was designed for, which was supplying energy for central generation uh, customers. And with the advent of rooftop TV, um, the network's now taken on a second role, and we're now um, seeing a, a very significant portion of the energy consumed in South Australia being delivered um, through our network from generation connected at the distribution network. As we move into the next five years, we'll see um, a continued uptake of residential batteries and we'll see virtual power plants playing an increasing role in providing balancing services to the overall system. So that's another source of value that, that was never previously delivered to our network, but now is. Um, beyond that, as we move 2025 and beyond, of course, with the transition to electric vehicles, um, our network takes on a further role as, as becoming essentially a primary fuel distribution network uh, for transport fuel for the state. So as we progress through time in this energy transition, we see um, the opportunity to create a lot more value for South Australians from the distribution network assets that we have in South Australia. Uh, next slide, please. So, as we all know, um, if we want to capitalise on these opportunities, we've got um, significant technical challenges to overcome. We all know that the networks that we have were designed for transporting energy in one direction, and as such, they have a limited capacity for transporting energy in the reverse direction. Um, and in South Australia, we think that's probably of the order of one to two kilowatts of export capacity per customer uh, in spring across most of our network. Um, 
and we're starting to um, starting to reach that level of capacity now across um, large areas of our network of solar penetration zones. And so what we see as a result of this is um, customers are starting to experience problems with their inverters tripping off due to over voltage in the middle of the day. Um, and virtual power plants are becoming impacted as well, um, where their ability to dispatch energy into the market can be reduced um, due to over voltage problems. So next slide, please. So we're pursuing a range of measures to try to increase the hosting capacity of our network. Um, in uh, at the end of December 2017, we changed our connection standards to require all new solar inverters to have uh, volt var response mode enabled, and we know this helps uh, significantly with uh, reducing the tendency for inverters to push up voltage in the middle of the day. We're partnering with a company um, to undertake a smart hot water trial in South Australia this year um, to shift some of our overnight hot water load into the middle of the day. Um, and in July this year, we also introduced for the first time new time of use network tariffs. Um, and these tariffs have a, a new super off peak period in the middle of the day. And again, that's to encourage customers and to reward customers um, for shifting some of the load into the, into the solar trough. Um, finally, we're about a third of the way through um, a $10 million program to update, uh, upgrade voltage regulation at about 140 of our major zone substations. Uh, covering about 70% of our customers. So this will um, significantly improve our capability to manage variations in voltage across the network. And that program will, will run through to about uh, the second quarter of next year. Next slide, please. Um, but as well as investments to add more capacity to our network, um, we also know that we have a lot of opportunity to make much better use of the capacity that we have. Um, when a customer connects an inverter to our network today, they receive as part of their connection agreement a fixed export limit, um, traditionally five kilowatts per customer. But in time, as the network becomes congested, that fixed limit will need to reduce um, if we're to maintain the network within its technical parameters at the worst case times of the year. So typically, very mild sunny days in spring, this kind of time of year. Uh, when we start to see uh, network congestion due to, due to solar PV in residential areas. And so our core strategy in this regard is to transition from fixed export limits, which are set at the time of connection, as this for the life of the inverter, to take advantage of the capabilities of smart inverters, internet connected inverters, to implement um, flexible export limits or, or dynamic operating envelopes. And the idea here is a customer inverter um, can essentially download on a daily basis from, from the distribution network a profile that, that sets its export limit in that location uh, at that time, according to the available capacity of the network. And by doing this, um, we can open up much more of the latent capacity of the network for exports outside of times um, when the network is congested. Next slide, please. So in, at the end of 2018, we were fortunate to receive um, a million dollars of grant funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency uh, to conduct a trial of this technology um, with Tesla and their virtual power plant in South Australia. Um, and that project went live around about the middle of last year. And we've been providing these kind of dynamic export limits to that BPP um, ever since then. So if you go to the next slide, please. So how this works is like this. So Tesla um, is uh, aggregating about a thousand customer batteries in their virtual power plant. There's a five megawatt BPP. Um, and they're trading through their retail partner, Energy Locals. They're trading that BPP into the market to provide um, both wholesale energy um, and also frequency support services or FCAS. Um, as the distribution network, we sit to the side and we're essentially providing a real-time service to Tesla, uh, to the virtual power plant. So we can publish through our web API. Uh, sorry, thank you. So we can publish through the web API um, a rolling 24 hour by five minute forecast of available hosting capacity on a locational basis across each different area of the BPP. Uh, and Tesla can use that information and take it into account when they choose how to bid and dispatch that BPP. So they can 
take advantage of available net network capacity when there is capacity, and they can also be sure that they're operating their, net their VPP within the constraints of the local network at times of congestion. So if you go to the next slide. So this is, this is a chart that shows what that looks like. Um, this is real data. It's a load profile from a single customer uh, across two days in February of this year. Um, the yellow line, oh, sorry, the orange line is the customer's load profile. Above the x-axis is energy imported from the grid and below is energy exported to the grid. And you can see the blue dotted line uh, shows what our normal static five kilowatt limit would have been for this customer. So it's a five kilowatt export limit. Uh, and the black profile along the bottom shows the flexible export limit that we were able to publish to this customer's inverter at this time. And you can see that we're able to make available um, up to 10 kilowatts of export capacity throughout the majority of this period, um, with that export limit only reducing through the very middle of the day um, when passive solar PV in the area is, is causing network congestion. And from the red line, you can see that the virtual power plant is able to take advantage of that. It means they can dispatch at much higher power than they would otherwise be able to do uh, in those shoulder periods. And that means they can deliver more services to the market and deliver more value. Next slide, please. Um, so from July this year, we entered our next five-year regulatory control period as a regulated distribution network. Um, the Australian Energy Regulator has approved uh, a $32 million uh, program of work for us over the next five years to take this capability from trials through to production. So as we approach the end of 2020, uh, we're reaching uh, the end of our PPP grid integration trial with Tesla. We'll be looking to open up that API to some of the other virtual power plants in South Australia. You can click, click ahead. Um, and we're very excited, probably, hopefully within the next week, we'll be able to announce the next trial in this area. So we've partnered with another distribution network interstate and some leading inverter manufacturers, solar inverter manufacturers, to build this capability directly into solar inverters. So we can extend this uh, flexible or dynamic export limit, not just to customers with batteries and VPPs, but to, but to all uh, customers connecting new solar to our network. And if you click again, uh, we'll be running this as a field trial commencing from April next year. Um, and at the end of that 12 month trial, around about April 2022, uh, we hope to be able to launch this as a standard connection service for new customers in South Australia. It's going to significantly increase the amount of solar we can uh, accommodate on our network and significantly increase the amount of value that customers can achieve. Okay, next slide, please. So, to summarize, um, as a distribution network, uh, owner and operator, we are tremendously excited by the transition to decentralized energy. Um, we see it as moving the distribution network from the periphery of the system to the very heart of the energy system. Um, and if we could do our job well and we can manage this transition, then we can create significantly more value for the community from the state's investment in its distribution network assets. So that means for solar customers, we can increase their capacity to export energy to the network improving their ROI, uh, you can click ahead. Uh, for virtual power plant customers and aggregators, we can increase access to markets so we can enable those uh, people to deliver more services and more value into the system. And finally, uh, what that means for all customers in combination uh, is we'll get a more efficient system overall. So put downward pressure on prices, um, improve system security, and give us a more resilient uh, and low carbon energy system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bryn. Excellent. It's, it's great to see, you know, how you're just going for it and you're just making this happen, which is quite uh, quite unique. I think many people spend the time thinking about it and you just um, building this capability up and you make it seem so easy. So, uh, so thank you very much for sharing us that. I think it's probably a lot of people will find this uh, very inspiring. So I think we'll uh, we come to the uh, to the Q and A session, and you know just keen to get everybody um, to ask questions that you still might have. We we're asking questions to Slido.com, and you can um, join this dashboard by putting in esec-3b. 
Um, we have already had a lot of questions um, come through, so um, we, we might um, start off with um, just going to a question for Jackie, which has come up. A lot of questions have come up around um, your COVID slides, and what happens to the downright. I think it'd be probably worthwhile um, if you can just elaborate a little bit more. I think the questions, you know, were basically um, a few people have asked, you know, have you, uh, what was the difference between the profiles? Um, I guess, have you corrected for uptakes of different years and then generally you know in terms of what did it mean for the for the uh, for the network in terms of uh, in terms of operations um and i think it would be just you know highlight important to highlight for people what was the what was the benefit of all that visibility that you gained uh, from the ten data and how was it used um, in practice Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so I have um, provided some written responses, but I, I did rush through those slides because yeah. I wanted to make sure we had time for everyone. But um, so the answers to the general gist of the questions is that it, it, the comparison I showed is a very simple uh, comparison of consumption for a month in 2019 compared to the same month or week in, in 2020. So it's not, it hasn't been corrected for weather or um, or increased um, installations of solar panels, which was one of the questions. So it is a very blunt um, view. And I guess the, the purpose of it was really more from the network perspective to understand how the changes in demands and consumption on the network might impact the operation of the network. Um, one of the questions was around, did we have any grid issues due to the lockdowns? Um, so I guess my answer would be that I think the grid's held up very well. Uh, the voltage management issues are ongoing and may have been exacerbated by lower minimum demands um, than perhaps would have been in, um, seen if not for some of the COVID restrictions. I think part of the reason this analysis is continuing on is that um, I think there's quite a concern that summer loading, if um, the restrictions continue, or even if people remain working from home in large numbers, um, the on very very hot days, the the extra air conditioning load through um, people being at home with potentially lots of appliances working, including aircon, um, whilst perhaps the CBD will be ramping back up and other businesses will be ramping back up, could. Um, mean that there's quite a, a big change in demand and consumption patterns um, through the networks. And I think that will be something that the network businesses in Victoria in particular will be keeping a very close eye on and AEMA as well. I think that maybe picks up most of the questions or the general gist of the questions that were uh, put through for me. Um, so maybe we'll hand to yeah, yeah. Just maybe following up. Is, are there any views just to contrast this, this uh, Brian and Rick? Do you have any views on that? You know, COVID and smart meter data and this kind of things about how it impacted your jurisdictions. Is there anything that uh, um, you know that that just aligns well with Jackie said for your own experience or uh, different views on that? I I can say from the US, we haven't seen a lot of. There hasn't been a lot of concern from you know, grid operators or distribution grid operators around COVID at this point. So. Yeah. yeah, so similar in, in South Australia, one thing that we were interested in would be the effect on uh, the solar industry, but we've really seen no slowdown at all in the rate of new installations. In fact, I think it's, if anything, whenever something like this happens, it, it increases people's uh, desire to, to try to become a bit more self-sufficient. So it probably drives more demand for, for rooftop solar. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Obviously, everybody's COVID on everybody's mind. And as I said, it will change certain things, but might not completely transform everything. So I think we move maybe to some questions that came up uh, regarding uh, Rick's presentation. And, and Rick was very active on on the, on addressing them already on um, through the chat function. Um, but I guess I just wanted to pull um, back to once. There was a few questions that came, you know, that all relate to um, value in wholesale markets. Uh, we have one um, one participant here asking about, you know, whether the, the right question to ask is if the ERs can provide value to the wholesale markets, or whether it should not be about the redesign of um, of markets. 
Um, and I think the, the following question, you know, in terms of uh, what, what type of approaches are con being um, considered to determine the value of DERs for distribution grid? So specifically, you know, one around the wholesale markets and the other one about distribution grid. So I think, uh, Rick, you probably uh, might be able to attack both of those and give us your view on that. Yeah, look, I think this question about can DER provide value to the wholesale markets, you know, sort of reframing it to, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't the value of DERs you know, total operation is if you combine DER with load and are you bidding that load into the wholesale market? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, I think if we move to sort of an independent DSO model, distribution system operator model, you know, essentially then you're saying, okay, the DSO is the aggregator of the DERs. And now you have this dynamic, you're able to sort of share, you know, part of the, part of the interesting thing about inter interconnecting DER to a wholesale market is to send the right price signals, right? Right now we have rates that are pretty static. Um, maybe we have time of use rates, maybe we don't. Um, and so you're not necessarily getting the right price signals um, and wholesale markets are obviously much better for price formation. The, the, the problem I think with this approach is right now, if right now the way the regulatory structure works in the United States is that essentially you'd be asking LSEs, load serving entities, to sort of have the DERs aggregated and then bid in their load into wholesale markets. And if you, then you have a monopsony, right? You have a single regulated entity. And this is the way it works in MISO today and in some, some of the wholesale markets today, where if you're a demand response or you want to, if you were DER and you want to participate in wholesale market, you essentially, the only way you can do that is through your utility. And your utility has no financial incentive to include you because they don't make any extra money on doing that. So I think you're, you're, that this question is a really great one, and I think it we absolutely unlock more value of DERs in wholesale markets if we had an independent distribution system operator. But in our current, at least in the U.S., in the current way that the regulatory structure kind of disallows that. Um, then I, I let me just quickly address. Somebody asked about if FERC Order twenty two twenty two is going to remove net metering. It's absolutely not. Uh, net metering is is not is not going away. Uh, that's a state jurisdictional issue and. Somebody, the industry recently just tried to get net metering killed at FERC and they failed miserably. Um, and then somebody asked about what types of approaches are being considered to determine the values of DER for the distribution grid. Uh, that's sort of a you know thesis level answer. There's a lot of different approaches um, and it's very tricky. And I think, you know, literally you can get, there'll be like competing studies that'll have radically different answers. That'll say the value is zero. And then other people will say, oh, the value is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so it really depends on sort of the approach that you take. And I'm talking about just the distribution grid, so just sort of deferred distribution value. Now, if you the, the approach that's being taken in most places is really to kind of what we call value stack and say that there's deferred distribution value, there's deferred transmission value, there's energy value, there's capacity value, there's some attribute value. And normally all those values are sort of added together to come up with some kind of like value of solar or value of DER tariff um, that's then instead of instead of net metering, which is just the avoided retail tariff. Uh, but calculating that avoided distribution value that DER provides is has been very tricky and complicated. And I don't I have yet to find a, an approach that I've that I find satisfactory. And I, th I think most people would agree with me. Do we have any view on Jackie and, and Bryn just on that value question? Is, is there anything specific that you would have done in, in, in your companies on that? Uh, I think I think it's a challenge for all distribution network owners. Um, this this challenge where being a distribution system operator is actually a different role, in my view anyway, um, and how to manage um, the keeping the network um, keeping the network operational and uh, efficient, but also providing the opportunity for people who have distributed resources to actually use those resources and and use the network as a platform for services and um, and creating value. That there's a there's a real challenge in those two. I think. There's, there's competing issues for trying to keep the cost of the network as low as possible for all consumers versus providing a platform that people can 
use to to trade and um, and and get the value out of the assets that they've invested in. I think there's a there's a real competition there, and it's not easy to find the solution to that. Yeah. Perhaps perhaps Bryn's discussion around tariffs might um, be one of the ways of of dealing with that competition. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think our our primary job as a network. Um, as Jackie says, is to try to enable customers to get the most value they can out of the assets that they're buying, whether it's through exporting solar to the network or enrolling their batteries in VPPs, um, and to do that at, at least cost. Um, I think as as more and more resources uh, uh, appear on our network, then that creates new opportunities as well for for customers to provide services back into the network. Um, as another value stack, um, I think we'll see more of those opportunities emerge uh, in coming years. Thank you. Now, before we move to a last set of questions that um, that will come regarding uh, Bryn's presentation. So, um, there's a different. I, I probably start with a set of questions that all relate to, you know, let's say really customers and what do they get out of this. I mean, the, the top question here is the one: How do you think customers should experience congestion, export, and import in the distribution network? Um, but I think if I go further down, there were uh, there was a question as well here, which is on how many days of the of uh, on how many days in the trial with the Tesla VPP would have, um, would you have limited? So I just, the question just jumped. Yeah, there it is, thank you. And with the Tesla VPP, would you have limited uh, below five kilowatt once a day, once a fortnight, never? Um, and I think um, another question um, was just regarding, you know, the benefits of exporting, exporting during the shoulder times, um, you know, and especially the, the, the um, that the participant is making the point that obviously it's the customers who paid for the assets and how do they get the value out of it. So um, I guess all these questions kind of relate in terms of, you know, what's in it for the customer. And I think it's probably a nice segue. You already alluded to that in your previous answer. So um, maybe you can drill down on those and um, give us a bit more on your perspective on what you've learned and what your position on that is. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. I've had a go at a few answers as well in Slido. My mm. answers are coming up as well. I think to the question of there were a few questions around what you know how do customers have the confidence to invest and how are they getting the value mm -hmm. from their services? Um, our role as the distribution network is is to provide the platform. So customers predominantly get the value from their services through the market. So that's that's not that's not our role. Um, customers enroll in virtual power plants, and it's really for their VPP aggregator or their retailer as to the kind of offer they can they can give and how much value they can create for that customer by trading their resources in the market. So that's our, our role in this whole thing is as an, as an enabler. We have the physical reality to, to manage, which is the physics of the network. It has a certain amount of capacity. Um, our job is to make as much of that available as possible for the least cost um, so that customers can uh, subscribe to these kind of schemes and, and be rewarded and get the most value that they can or provide the most value the system uh, from this from the, the resources they've they've installed I think one of the questions was around uh, how customers can have confidence in how much capacity they're going to receive from the network and I think that's definitely something that we're looking into as as we build the systems that we need to be able to calculate local capacity more accurately and provide flexible uh, export limits um, we'll also be able to obviously publish more of that information out so that customers can have a better sense of the available capacity in their local area. And I think that will that will help both customers and the operators um, to make informed choices when they're installing equipment. Thank you, Ben. Um, do you have any view, Jackie, do you want to share any view on, on that specifically? Is that something you've been experiencing in, um, with young, in, in Victoria with Rosnet? And I guess we, it's equally from the US perspective, you, you mentioned some of, you already discussed those, those points, but if there's anything you want to reply, feel free to go ahead. Uh, I think, uh, uh, just quickly, I think I uh, totally agree with the, um, the comments that Bryn provided and certainly Osnet's distribution network is is seeing a lot of very similar challenges where we've got um, we've got the solar homes program in Victoria, 
um, which is encouraging a huge amount of um, rooftop PV to be installed. Um, or we already have a large amount and, and that's growing. And the, the volume of that aggregated is, is equivalent to you know, a large power station. So the management of that injection of generation into different parts of the network is, is getting a lot of attention from all distribution businesses, but also the flow on effects of how that interacts with transmission um, is, is increasingly coming to, to the planners' um, attention as well. So I think we're all working on how to get the best value out of the network. Um, and 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 allow as much generation as possible to come in, but but the the physics of the of the situation is that that you know the the current network has limitations. So unless we increase the capacity um, in particular locations, there are always going to be limitations. Thanks, uh, Rick. Anything to add? I mean, I'm just jealous that we don't have <laughs> independent distribution system operators in the US because it's it's such an elegant solution to a lot of these problems, right? To have a to have somebody like Bryn who just says, "Look, I, you know, you make money in the market. My job is to provide a platform for you to plug in and and work, and I'm gonna work around the limits I've been given." Um, that's just such a better. I mean, that's the reason we moved to independent system operators on the wholesale market is exactly the same. I think it's the same logic now follows on the distribution system and you know the US is just behind the uh, Australia in this in this situation where we have kind of slow moving you know their asset owners and and operators and so they just don't they're not motivated to create a platform right because that's not their job their job is really as asset owners um, no, thanks. I just, um, yeah, we're, we're now to the, you know, official time is over one o'clock, but I, um, we've been going for one hour, but I hope, you know, we, there's a few more questions that I'd like us to get um, maybe through if you want to uh, hold the line. I just, you know, for those that do need to leave us, I just want to say that, you know, an email will be sent to all participants with the recording and with the slide pack. And, you know, also feel free to ask any additional um, um, questions um, that you might have. But I think it's also important at this stage again to really thank really almost all three presenters today. I think, you know, you always, it's great that you put this, uh, you know, amount of your time, make yourself available, put the time in to pre prepare, figure yourself out that you share these experiences with the world. So um, huge thank you to all three of you. Um, and I also, again, wanted to uh, acknowledge the huge efforts from uh, the team at EM, uh, EMO, uh, Taru, Kylie, and Christian, and particularly behind getting this off the ground. Um, you know, there's a lot of day-to-day -day, um, things that need to be done to make an event like this online or physically happen. So um, huge um, thank you for that. And I think um, it's, it's a, it's, you start an important discussion um, in the region. So, um, so again, thank you. Um, I, I was just um, for those that want to stay with us. I, I was just quite keen to uh, move into the move to that next top uh, quest, uh, top question there, which is will be a very important one because the, um, the the question is: Can you belay my fear of big business? And I'm noting here, big business is not only new players like Tesla, but also the incumbent energy retailers um, looking to monopolize VPP. So obviously, you know, it's a bit of a uh, mar market access competition question question, regulatory question. So I'm sure each of you will have a, um, a good view on, on, on what you think is happening there. And I think it's obviously early days because we, to many of those degrees, we actually want the incumbents to take the leadership, but we also want competition and new ideas to um, to happen. And, and so I guess I'd like to just add a little angle when, how much does regulation need to interfere and when? Um, um, because you obviously want to see a lot more of those, those development as Rick alluded to, um, because you know we will, we'll, we'll, you know, projects like the one that Brain presented are obviously important for the world to learn from. So, um, so I leave it to the uh, panelists to share their thoughts and um, maybe you know to change the order a bit. Maybe we'll um, should we start with uh, with Rick in this instance? Is that to get the get to give the you know give our international presenter the first opportunity to uh, and then we go back to the australian perspectives with jackie and Bryn. sure um look i don't know steve this is different i think this is yeah. you know, this is a hard question i mean look 
in some ways, like, especially if you think about the federal rule in the US that just got announced, I mean, it's really about DER aggregators. So I think there's, there's got to be, you, you know, interacting with a wholesale energy market is a complex, complex thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think having a layer, you know, of whatever you want to call it, big business, some kind of DE aggregator, you know, Tesla, Sun, Sunrun, you know, somebody who interfaces between the consumer and connects them to a bigger, broader market. You know, that's just like, you know, the middleman, right? I mean, if you're a farmer and you grow tomatoes, like you want, you know, you've got, a, you, you know, you're not going to, you can't sell them to every single supermarket in the, in the country, right? So um, I think there's always going to be a role for business, but I think it's, you know, as long as the, as long as the market is designed well and streamlined, I think that that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, I forget that Australia still has this like good, good in individualistic spirit, you know, in the U S people would be like, well, of course that's, that's, you know, the business of America is business. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. No, it certainly does. Thank you. Jackie, bring any perspectives that form uh, do you, can you relate to the question, I guess, and the different view that, uh, how Rick alluded to that? Uh, yeah, well, I guess I don't think we can lay the fears that that, that li most likely um, uh, proponents for VPPs are going or well, have so far been um, energy retailers and um, and the need for those people to be able to bring together a large number of customers and have the sort of systems that can can manage those can a contact them but also manage them. I think it's quite likely that they. Um, will continue to be key players in aggregating um, distributed energy resources. And of course, also, um, if you think back to that slide about how the, the value chain is changing, I think energy retailers are looking for new opportunities to be valuable. Um, and, that, and that kind of aggregation of large numbers of resources is probably one where they've got, you know, systems they can leverage to do that. So. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that we can allay that fear. <laughs> um, but uh, interested to hear what Bryn has to say on that on that point. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. I think I would just observe that we do have competition in this space. It's it's very early days, of course, but um, I am encouraged that in South Australia we do have, as I said at the beginning, nine I think nine different virtual power plant schemes now in South Australia. Um, so, so I think so long as customers uh, have choice, um, I think at the moment what we're seeing is is we're, you know we're not seeing a lot of lock-in. I don't think I think customers are able to um, to pick which scheme they want to join. Um, if they want to join a virtual power plant scheme, they don't have to. Um, and they're at the, at the moment certainly I think I'm aware that customers are able to move between schemes as well. So. So I think you'll see as the, as the market plays out, I think you'll see all sorts of different business models emerging. Some will, will offer customers some additional benefits for some additional lock-in. Um, but I think the main thing is that customers have the information that they need to make informed choices. Yeah, and let's, if I could just add, let's not forget that, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> customers wouldn't have had any of these choices to deploy mm -hmm. energy generation at their site, right? So we're, we're actually going much, you know, the there was no choice, right? You had a you had a monopoly you had a monopoly energy services provider, uh, and that was it. Um, you it, know, it, to choose the retailer, Rick, there was no option to yeah. choose the retailer yeah. twenty years ago. Mm. Right, right. So you you didn't have any choice as a customer, and so now, well, I understand that you know you're concerned about that the that the you know the aggregator of your of your battery is is could be a could be a big company. The fact of the matter is, twenty years ago, you couldn't even put a battery at your home or solar. Um, and so, you know, I think we're moving in, in a much, you know, customer choice is so much better than, I mean, the whole point of one of the driving things behind DER is really to increase customer choice and customer engagement with the energy system. So I think that's a, a really huge positive. Yeah. Thanks Rick for flicking that around. I think that's, that's a very good point to remind ourselves to see the, see the huge upsides and progress made. 
I, I just said in the, you know, to, to finish this off, you know, there's one very, very question that keeps going up the rank that I think we probably should address that because um, typically I think the panel's Q&A session probably opens up with the open-ended question and with the open-ended question. So we just had the open-ended one. So maybe now we're very more, um, you know, one about good old standards, but which are usually important, typically not the, the type of questions that um, that we can finish off, but I think it's it's a good one because obviously in terms of practical implementation, in terms of what next, what is needed next, um, um, it, it cannot be understated. So the um, the question here is, um, you know, what are the next steps needed for standardization of the comms and interoperability requirements of parties that need to interact with DERS um, and, um, you know, to make sure the adoption is as broad as possible and that we can really unleash the benefits that, for example, we've seen from Bryn's trial in terms of dynamic DR management. Um, so, Bryn, I, I guess specifically for you, so I, I, I'll leave it to you. And if any of the other participants wants to, uh, a panelist wants to add something, um, I'll, I'll, the floor is open. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'll just say there's there's a lot of effort underway at the moment. There's a there's a working group called the DR um, Standards Working Group that's that has a bunch of different players from industry as well as distribution networks and AEMO and others, um, all working on trying to progress towards common national standards for for smart inverters and smart cons. Um, we think IEEE 2030.5 is the is the right answer. That's the basis that that will be the basis of these standards, and we're very actively engaged in that process. So I think I'm quite optimistic. There's a lot of there's a lot of effort going in in that space at the moment, and a lot of alignment across across all players in in industry. Thanks. Well, I think we we don't see any any addition. If there's no additions on this, um, I think we'll, we're going to close at this stage. So again, I, I'm going to send a virtual round of applause to everybody, uh, including the, the panelists, but also all the participants. It wouldn't be possible without you. And again, a huge thank you to AEMO and ESIC, the Energy System Integration Group, for uh, for organizing this. Um, um, I hope, you know, please feel free to reach out of any of us if you have further questions and hope to see you at an at a real event physically in the near future. So thank you all and bye bye. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks all. Left recording.